Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Yasmina Greco. I'm with O'Reilly Media, and I'll be your host for today's webcast. Today, folks, we have people from all over the world joining us, so we will say a big shout-out of hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Thanks for being with us. Today we have Jesse Freeman, and he's going to deep dive into HTML5 game design with you all. Jesse is a technology evangelist at Microsoft, and he's been on the cutting edge of interactive development with a focus on the web and mobile platforms. He's an expert in his field. He has worked for VW, Tommy Hilfiger, Heavy, MLB, the New York Jets, HBO, and many more. Jesse is a seasoned speaker who has presented at numerous conferences, and he is the author of the best-selling O'Reilly Media book, Introducing HTML5 Game Development. We're very excited to have Jesse with us today to present this webcast for you all. As we get things started, I'd like to go over a little housekeeping to help you get the most out of today's webcast. You'll want to open your group chat widget if you haven't already done so. This is where we can interact with each other during the event and where you can submit your questions for Jesse. We find that our audience usually has a lot of good knowledge to share, so we encourage you all to chat freely during the event. However, if you have questions for Jesse, please preface them with a capital letter Q so we know that they're for him and we can make sure we see them for Q&A. You can also open, move, and resize any of the other widgets. If you'd like to tweet from the Twitter widget today, you might need to give it permission to access your account. It will automatically append the event's hashtag to your tweet so you don't have to. And today we have two hashtags, HTML5 and FluentConf, all one word. If you have any trouble during the event, please take a look at your help widget. If you continue to have problems, just post it in the group chat and one of our staff will help you right away. For choppy audio or stalled visuals, please try refreshing your window. And remember, the best thing you can do for a good audio stream is to close any apps that could interfere. People always ask, so we'd like you to know. We are recording today's webcast, and we'll have the archive ready, usually within 48 hours. And folks, at this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to Jesse for his presentation. Hello, Jesse. Hi. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is always the weird part where I can't see anyone, and I'm just talking to myself in my office. But uh, thank you all for uh, joining, and we're going to do a little talk about uh, HMO5 game design. And I was very specific to pick this title because I talk a lot about the technical side of HMO5 gaming, and in this one I really wanted to talk about actual game design and how I went about building my latest game, uh, Super Jetroid. So we're going to go through a lot of demos that show off the core principles of game design and really highlight the fact that HTML5 gaming is coming into its own and that a lot of the stuff that we've been able to do on other platforms, especially around casual gaming, can all be done now uh, through HTML5. So with that, um, I had a brief introduction. I won't bore you with too many more of the details, but uh, I am a technology evangelist at Microsoft and my focus is on uh, HTML5 and, and gaming for Windows 8. And uh, my website, if you're interested, is jessefreeman.com. I'm also on Twitter. And my email at Microsoft is jesse.freeman at microsoft.com. And a big part of what my job is is to help developers get their games onto Windows 8. And one of the reasons why I joined Microsoft was because of the amazing support for HTML5 uh, to build a native app with HTML5 on Windows 8. So if you're working on a HTML5 game or any other type of game and you have interest in getting onto Windows 8 and don't know where to start, please feel free to email me or check out my blog and I have lots of information on that. So with the introduction out of the way, we'll kind of get started and I'll talk about uh, this game. It's called Super Jetroid and uh, there's a link there. Uh, fair warning, I don't have a mute button on the start screen so you have to actually get into the game, play it, and if you pause it, you'll see in the pause menu you'll be able to turn the sound off. But um, that being said, uh, Super Jetroid, I've been working on this game for a very long time. The basic concept is I wanted to make a game that wasn't violent. And I really love space and my son who's three and a half years old, 
he really is into space now, so I've been trying to make these games to, for him to kind of play. Uh, and this game is really about balancing greed uh, with survival. So there are no weapons in the game. It's really about exploration and discovery. And you are a space explorer stuck in a cave, and you have to make your way through, and you have health, air, and fuel, and you have to balance the three of them. And the goal is to find as much stuff in the caves you can collect um, crystals, and you can find alien artifacts and discover aliens, and you have to find as much of that and then escape before you run out of air. So the real motivation for actually finishing this game, because like a lot of people, I have a bunch of games that I've started and have never finished, and what's really been motivating me lately is uh, One Game a Month, which has uh, been created by uh, McFunky Pants on Twitter, and this is a really great, uh, I wouldn't even say it's a competition, it's just, it's a lifestyle basically. It's, it's really about just making a game each month and really focusing on actually launching it and publishing it. So I think that's the hardest part about making a game. We all have really good ideas about games, and sometimes we just get really bogged down in the details or make something that's way too complex. And I think that the drive of one game a month is really to just focus on what's really important in the game and get it out there so people can actually play it. So if you're not uh, already signed up for it, it's not too late, and you can uh, you can start submitting your games, and there's a leaderboard and all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's, it's really interesting because it gamifies making games. So the engine I used, obviously, because I wrote a book on ImpactJS, uh, was ImpactJS. And for those of you who are not familiar with ImpactJS, uh, it's a JavaScript game framework. And it takes advantage of uh, the browser's canvas element in order to create high-performance 2D games on the web and even mobile. And this framework was created by Dominic, and this is probably uh, one of the best frameworks out there. I think um, one of the barriers of entry that keep people from actually checking out Impact is that there's a $100 licensing fee. But once you pay the fee, uh, you get the full source code to the engine, you get Wellmeister, which is a level editor, and you get free updates to the next version. Um, I know that he's been talking a lot on the forum about working on version two. Uh, version one is incredibly stable and super fast. And having a level editor that's also built on the same game engine that you're building. So the other reason why I picked um, Impact is because it has a very low barrier of, of setup. So really to get started, you just need any IDE. Uh, it's JavaScript, so there's nothing really holding you back. I'm a big believer in having, you know, uh, IntelliSense and code hinting. So I use Visual Studio and ReSharper. Um, before that, you know, if you're on a Mac and you don't have access to Visual Studio, you can use WebStorm. And there's a lot of other really good, I mean, you can even use TextMate and Sublime Edit. Anything that'll just edit HTML and JavaScript will work. The, uh, the other thing you'll need is Apache just for hosting it and PHP for saving levels with Weltmeister. Uh, PHP isn't critical, but you won't be able to save any of the levels from the level editor. And also in order to publish it and minify the game, it uses a PHP script. But then for browsers, uh, it works in all uh, browsers. So it works really well in Chrome, in IE. Uh, it works in Firefox as well. So, and, and once you get into the newer browsers, you start getting hardware accelerated Canvas, and, and that's also incredibly helpful for your games. So I mentioned the PHP uh, requirement. There's also some other options. If you're interested, you can do uh, Node.js, um, which is pretty interesting as well. Uh, you can also host it on .NET if uh, you use IIS, and you can also use Ruby. So you're not just tied into PHP. The biggest thing that really appealed to me for Impact was this notion of multi-platform publishing. So I talk a lot about building games for Windows 8, but I'm really in love with the web. And you know, as far as I'm concerned, while mobile is taking off, the web is still a huge, huge important part of my development life. So being able to target the web and other devices is critical. I don't want to just have a game that's landlocked into one ecosystem. And with that in mind, Impact supports a lot of different ways of publishing your game. So you can do desktop browsers or Chrome, Safari, Firefox, Internet Explorer 9 and above. You can do mobile browsers, so iOS and Chrome for Android. Uh, you, the only thing about mobile is that audio is still kind of spotty since 
the browsers are still implementing the audio tags. You can also publish to web markets such as the Chrome store or Mozilla's uh, web, store, web store, which I think may actually be open now. Um, then you can also do iOS natively. So uh, Dominic has been working on this project called Ejecta. Ejecta is a wrapper for OpenGL so that you can write Open, you can write your Canvas to your Canvas API is basically to OpenGL, and that's pretty uh, interesting open source project. You can also wrap it in a web view. So there's a lot of different types of web view wrappers out there. Cocoon.js is a really cool one, which actually does the same thing as kind of what Ejecta does, but it'll also allow you to get onto Android and, and other uh, platforms. AppMobi has a solution for impact. You can just do phone gap and put a web view in. Again, you're going to have to deal with the audio, but you can always bridge the audio uh, to native uh, through phone gap. And then you can just do, if you wanted to do iOS uh, or uh, OS X and you wanted to get into the store, you can just put it in a web view and publish that. The real thing, though, that really that attracts me, and like I said, one of the reasons why I joined Microsoft is on Windows 8. However, if you want to be on the Windows 8 store, all you do is just drop your impact game into a Visual Studio project, hit compile, and it's a native app. And the performance is incredibly uh, fast. And a lot of the cool stuff, especially in this game uh, on the Windows Store, what I've been able to do is I can plug in Xbox controllers to a Surface tablet, and I have a portable console on the go. go. So Windows 8 is, is a pretty amazing platform if you're coming from an HTML5 or web background and looking to get your stuff into a market and sell it. So now that I've kind of talked about the framework, I'll move over to kind of the asset pipeline. And I do this, I have this, these slides in a lot of my talks, and I talk about workflow for creating games and artwork and assets. And really, the asset pipeline just refer, uh, refers to this workflow uh, that you create for your project. So it could be as simple as copying files over by hand, uh, or it could be as complex as writing scripts to generate uh, the art and everything for you. And, and I'm more so on the latter. When it comes to getting to all these different platforms, I actually use uh, Ant to build out multiple versions. I've also been playing around with Node.js to do my build scripts. So I have a very automated system going on to, to target each of the platforms that I want to publish my game to. So a big part of these kind of games, I'm, I'm very in love with retro 8-bit and 16-bit games. And a big part of that is working with sprites. So uh, if you're familiar with sprites, it's basically just a bitmap image that's drawn to the display. And in this case, it would be canvas. And they're usually organized into strips. So you can have them as horizontal or vertical strips or even as grids. And the real key defining part about sprites is that they're usually a set size. So you define a square. Um, so this is 16 by 16 wide. And from there, I can say, okay, use frame one or two or three and multiply it by the width and the height of that sprite and find it. So it's a very linear, uh, static process. Sprites are also used a lot in uh, tile maps. So when you're building out the maps, so you'll see impact really excels at tile map game, tile map based games. And in this case, this is just a small preview of one of the tile sets and some of the tiles in the game. And another really great thing, um, this is artwork. All the artwork was done by, um, by a really great designer, Anaki Diaz. And uh, what I had him do and, and what I really suggest in your own games is when we work through the art, especially if you're hiring someone else to do the artwork, is come up with like mood boards and try to get a real sense for what the animation is going to look like in the backgrounds itself instead of building it in a vacuum. So in this case, you can see I had him mock up these concept art boards and it really helped me say, you know what, I really want this or that, or I need to tweak it, but I can actually see it on the backgrounds and in the level without having to do a lot of design work. Again, here are just some concepts of, he, he gave me a bunch of choices for aliens. Obviously, I said I want all of them in the game. So, and then from here, you know, he can go through and make modifications, and we can just keep passing this back, and I can get the real relationship between the player size and the monster size and make sure that everything is looking right. And quickly, I started running uh, into some bottlenecks with sprites. And sprites are really great, like I said, for linear uh, file sizes. So if everything is always going to be 16 by 16 or whatnot. But when you start getting into more complex uh, stuff like UI, for example, in your game, 
I started moving up to something called texture atlases. And a texture atlas is just a large image. It's very similar to a sprite sheet. But the real defining thing is that when you generate this type of file, there's an atlas file which creates all of the coordinates for how to cut that image, uh, each one of those sprites out of the image. So uh, this is really big in 3D. And it actually has a lot of big advantages on uh, in HTML5 games, especially for file size, because I'm able to take all of my artwork and put them into much larger images so that I can cut down on the amount of connections I need for loading graphics. And to kind of give you a sense of how this works, on the right you'll see this is the packaged up um, texture. And here's just some JSON that comes out of the file. It says, okay, I want to get the radar sprite. And here's its, its, its X and Y position in the image and its width and height. Another thing that's really great about this technique as well is that one, you can automate it. So part of my build script actually just goes through folders full of individual sprites and packages them up into textures. And also since I'm now looking at the actual name of the file versus the, the index of it in a sprite sheet, I can change things around on the fly and my game is smart enough to adapt. So if I wanted to make the radar bigger, I don't have to go back into my game and change anything in the game. I just put a new graphic in the folder and everything works. So some of the tools that I've been using for my games, I'm really a big believer in open source and obviously free software, and there's some really great applications out there to help you build games. Uh, Asaprite is probably my favorite. It's an awesome, awesome uh, pixel editor. And you can just find that at asaprite.org. And some of the advantages of this is that, obviously outside of it being free and open source, is that it's a really great pixel editor. It's just for doing pixel art. That's all that it is. It has great animation tools for dealing with frames and, and layering and stuff like that. It allows you to import and export sprite sheets. So you can bring in a bunch of images and it's smart enough to say, oh, you know, each one of these images is named uh, with a number. I'll import these in and then I'll turn this into an animation for you and then you can export it as a sprite sheet. It handles layers and it's cross-platform, although it's a little bit wonky on, um, I, on, on Macs. So I would suggest using something like Pixin, which is very similar, but that's just for Macs. But on PC, this is an amazing uh, piece of software and incredibly stable. For packaging up uh, texture atlases, I've been using this, uh, this Air app called Shoebox. And this is really great because it also, not only does it let you do texture atlases, but it also lets you do pixel fonts. So some of the advantages of using this, you know, outside of it, again, for being free, is that you can create your texture atlases um, with a data file. It allows you to extract sprites. So if you have sprite sheets from Asaprite, you can extract them and turn them into texture atlases. Um, you can create custom atlas data templates. So out of the box, it supports a few. But I modified it and created one for JSON. You can have XML or text or anything, really. Uh, it also supports bitmap fonts. So when you're building games like this, you know, while Canvas has a, a font uh, API, you, you generally want to use a bitmap font because you want to make sure that it's rendering correctly. It adds a little overhead to it. But this way, it's still part of your, your pipeline and your asset work, workflow. So in this case, I use Shoebox to create a bunch of the bitmap fonts that you see throughout the game. And also, it's cross-platform, so it's made with Air, and it works really great with Cocos 2D, Unity 3D, HTML5. So not only is this a great tool for doing HTML5, Deb, you can use it for anything else uh, if you're building games in other platforms. And finally, the last thing which is always gets people is making uh, sound effects. So I use this app called uh, BFXer. Um, again, this is another Air app. It's great. You can use it online, or you can install it as an Air app. And it looks incredibly daunting uh, when you open it up for the first time. But all this does is this generates 8-bit sound effects. And on the left-hand side, you'll see that there's a lot of um, there's a lot of presets for things. But really, what I wind up just doing is just hitting random for about an hour and saving out the sounds that I like. And then you can tweak them. I don't even know what half of those knobs do. I, like I said, I just really love random. All the sound effects that are in this game came from this. Um, the music came from uh, Sean McCracken, 
which I'll talk about a little bit later, but all the sound effects are all from, from this uh, app. So that being said, I figured I'm going to go through each piece of the game itself and talk about how I designed it and some of the things you should think about doing in your own games. So I'm going to switch over real quick to screen share. I just want to make sure that everyone gets this URL because it's probably not going to look very good over the stream and I want to make sure that you guys can play along at the demos uh, yourself. So this is on my website and when I switch over to the screen share, real quick, assuming this works, waiting for it to think. Oh, and there is a error. Bear with me one second while I try to get the screen share to work again. All right, and while Jesse's working on that, folks, um, we'd like to let you all know his book. Jesse's book is the O'Reilly Deal of the Day. And what that means for you is you can get it today at a great, great price. We've pushed out a code to you all in the group chat. So if you have a moment to take a look at that, um, boy, that book can really help you with your day-to-day. -day. Lots of good information and details there. Great. So it's telling me that you guys are seeing it. Hopefully everyone's seeing my screen share now. We do. We see it. Great. And for anyone who missed the URL earlier, uh, this is the full URL for the demos. It's up on my website, so you can play along while I go through each of the demos. And uh, obviously, after this screencast, you guys can go through it. So I want to talk a little bit about the demo uh, harness that I built. So I come from enterprise software development, and I'm very big in test-driven development and all these kind of really great architectural things that you do in enterprise that really in games you don't do a lot of. And while I didn't use TDD in this game, I did use a visual test, and I built this harness that goes through and breaks out each of the elements of the game so that I can test it. So the first demo that we're going to look through is the splash screen demo, and this just validates that the splash screen works. So the splash screen is a really critical part of your game because it's obviously the first thing that your players see. And I'm not a big tutorial person. I hate it when you go into a game and it tries to cram these speech bubbles down your throat, like, hey, move to the left, move to the right. So one thing I do is I take advantage of this thing called an attract loop, which is really popular in arcade games to keep the screens from burning in. And what it allows me to do is, if you just sit idle on the screen for a second, it just starts going through the tutorial of how to play the game. And it'll just keep looping back and forth to uh, the main screen and going back, and if at any point you click on it, it'll jump back immediately to uh, the launch, and then from there you can go right into the game. So what's also really good about this is that I spend a lot of time on the design of each of these screens, and I actually make them my screenshots. So when I go to publish my game, not only do I get to show people a sense of what the game looks like, but I also put the tutorial of the game in the actual screenshots when I submit it to a market. So you get a lot of bang for your buck out of a technique like this. So the next one I want to talk about is the uh, level select. So I was really against doing these, but it, there's no way around it now. Most casual games on mobile have this notion of a level select. And if you go through and you hit up and down, you can unlock levels. And if you hit the one, two, and three keys or zero, you can add stars. So you can see, so here I am able to test out all the graphics. And a big thing that, that I had to go through and do was in order to control, uh, in order to support controllers uh, and keyboard, I need to make sure that I can cycle through all of these instead of it just being mouse driven. So I had to do some stuff like making it wrap around. I mean, these are all basic UI things, but you don't think about them until the last minute. So it wasn't until I started like playing around the Xbox controller and I'm like, wow, you know, I really wish I could actually move left and right and select things through the controller or through the keyboard. Another thing that I did is I really made this very simple. So programmatically, it's all that this screen does is I have an array that keeps track of the high score of each level. And every time you complete a level and you get a high enough score to unlock the next level, I push a new object into the array and I save the array locally. 
So using local storage, I'm able to pull out that array, um, and then in this case, I'll just render out all the boxes in the array. So every time you hit up, I just add an object to the array. When you hit down, I remove an object. And it, the reason I kind of bring this up is just you have to think really simply about this kind of stuff. Instead of architecting this really big, complex system, just stick with very basic objects. Because one, you want to be able to save that data and parse it very quickly. And two, this doesn't really warrant anything more than a couple of objects in an array. Why do I need track of the levels that you're not in. The other thing that I also want to bring up is this difficulty setting here. So again, I talked about my three and a half year old playing my games. It, it's very important to me that he is able to play my games. So I went through and I set up this mode called have fun. And in that case, I take away the health, the energy, and the air meters, and you can't be hurt. So it's almost like invincibility mode. And what's great about this is that my son can play the game. He doesn't get to unlock other levels, but he looks to me to unlock the levels anyways, because usually most of the games are too hard for him. And then he gets to go and play around in it, and he's happy. And I'm seeing a lot of games do this in the stores. I've seen it on Android where, people, uh, where games are doing um, light or kid versions of, the, of their self, but I feel like building into the same game so you, have, you maintain the same code is really key. So that's the basics of, of just this level select screen. The next thing that's really important is the score and reward screen. So in this case, in the game, I keep track of there's a set number of crystals, artifacts, and life forms that you have to find in the level. And I really love roguelike games, so I wanted to keep the sense of randomness to the, to the game. So the value of crystals or artifacts or life forms, uh, well, life forms are always there, but the, the value of them is random. So you may find the crystal in one place that's really valuable, or you may find one that's really garbage the next time you play. So that every time you play the level, you can get a better score based on the randomness of, of the distribution of the objects. That being said, in order to calculate the final ranking to see if you unlock the level, I can just do a percentage and say, here are the total number of things that you needed to find. How many of them did you find? And if you hit up and down, you can see the different rankings that you would get. So anything above, uh, anything average and above you'd wind up unlocking the next level and going there. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out is if you watched uh, the score, I use tweens a lot. I actually should have talked about this on the other screens, but uh, I'm using a library called Tween Light for JavaScript. If you come from Flash, this was a really great Flash library, and it's been ported over to JavaScript. Um, everything here is tween, and I'm really big on this motion, uh, making sure that everything has this, you know, organic slide if you maybe it's because I come from a flash background but I can't stand it when I see screens after screens that just pop up and don't have any transition and also you know take advantage of the fact that you can tween things so in this case I tween the value of the score so that it just comes up and it's just a very simple technique but I do that all over the place and it adds a lot more depth to your game so next up is just a very basic touch uh, keyboard demo so you'll see here, what's great about this demo, you know, outside of just being able to move around and fly and test it out, is that one, I can make sure that the keyboard controls work. And also I can just test out the physics of the game. So if I needed to go through and I needed to fix a few things, I can actually do that um, in the console. I can tweak gravity and test all that out. So this is a really good demo that let me just go through and clean up a lot of the movement. Some of the things that are really key into how this guy moves and the feeling you get of the responsiveness is I do stuff where he slides a little bit when he walks and turns around, so I lower the friction of, of his walking a lot, so he has that kind of organic slide. Also, I bounce the player a little bit when he hits the ground. So if you're going really fast and you hit the ceiling, he bounces, or the ground he bounces. And also, the faster you go the rocket, I have the screen shake, so I try to give this sense of there are parts in the game where if you fall down a really long uh, tunnel, you can actually get hurt or kill yourself. So I try to up the um, drama of it, I guess you could say, by doing some very basic effects like shaking the screen the faster you go to really give the player the sense of movement, even though he's not really moving that quickly through the screen. The next demo is pretty key if you're doing anything related to mobile. So this is just a touch mouse controller, 
And if you click down on the screen, you'll see a virtual controller gets popped up, and from here you can actually control the whole game. So this works with the mouse. It's very awkward to use with the mouse. It works really great on a touch screen. And there isn't a game that I build that doesn't have touch controls. Because at this point, I'm trying to get my game on every platform possible, and I want it always to work on touch screen. So there's always some sort of basic mouse control. And a big thing that I'm also trying to work on very hard in, in all of my games now is one button control, which is incredibly hard. I mean, in this game it works really well because there is no combat, so there's no need to fight uh, or hit a fire button or jump. So being able to have the controls as simplified as possible is, means I don't have to deal with each browser having its own way of handling multi-touch or issues with multi-touch, so I can keep the controls really simple and they work across the board from desktop all the way down to mobile. The next demo, or the next set of demos, are Alien AI. So this game at its core is really a platformer. So there's a lot of typical AI uh, that you could have, or a couple of typical AIs you would have. The first one is just the move left and right and don't fall off the ledge. So as you see, these guys are just going to go back and forth. And I designed this level in a very special way to make sure that I can test all the use cases. Here is a, here's a platform that has no sides. Here is the floor with two sides so he can walk back and forth and make sure that he, does, he hits that. Here's one where it's attached to the left side, and here's one where it's attached to the right. So a big part of this test harness that I built is making sure that I can test all the edge cases. Also, you'll see each of these sprites or each of the aliens has its own sprite for color. So you can do this kind of stuff on the fly uh, very easily through the bitmap data, like create a new canvas off the display and change the uh, tint of, of the aliens. But I tend to do that all, all that stuff ahead of time and pre-process it because I really don't want to have any overhead, especially if I'm going to a mobile uh, device. I don't have any overhead of having to recreate all these graphics and keep it in memory. So if you can, try to pre-generate all the different variations and colors of your, of your monsters. I mean, this is such an old technique. This goes all the way back to Nintendo, where you know maybe the red guy would be a lot faster than the yellow guy. So you can do a lot of really cool things by just changing the color of, of the sprite. So Alien B's um, AI is a little bit different. This guy just waits. He's a lurker, and when you get close, he attacks you. So a lot of these aliens are designed in order to bottleneck the player. So here you get a really good sense of how high can I fly without triggering an alien, but if I'm too low, I'm going to get attacked. So and this is really the case where I want to make sure that the, the player is, is working around these aliens and not not taking damage and that they can fly down tight corridors and not just be aimlessly walking around not fearing anything. So and each one of these also has its own color. So and I can set these colors to be random, so if I don't assign a color value to it, it'll just randomly pick one. So Alien C is this big looking thing with tentacles and he's really slow at moving and he's not a threat at all to the player. Um, this alien is really made to be put down corridors and stuff where he'll box the player in, like here's a good situation where both of them are going to get the player at the same time. Um, there's not much more to it. I'll show what the real purpose of this alien is in a future demo, but right now just to give you the sense that they, they have the same logic. They can move up to a platform, but they won't fall off and they'll just sit there and wait for the player and it's variable how close they have to be. So I can make some of these guys more sensitive to the player and others where you have to be right up on the alien in order to get it to wake up. And the final alien are just these spitter guys and um, they just randomly spit in there. Again, really good for corridors where you want to try to get the player to run through. Again, each one of these is randomly spitting, but I can synchronize them, so I can have delays, or I can have them all spit at the same time or randomly. So you can do a lot of really great things by using these to, to, to block the player. And that kind of sums up all of 
the aliens. The other part of, of really good platformers are puzzles. And these are all very basic puzzles. The simplest of them is usually blocks. So some really good techniques for when you're building blocks is I try to make them look a lot like the surrounding tiles, but if you wait long enough, you'll see that there's a nice animation that reflects, that lets the player know that, oh, hey, there's something up with this, you can move it. Um, the player also has an idle animation if you leave him alone. So trying to take advantage of, of attracting the player to where he needs to go is really key. This is also good because I, as I was testing this out, I was seeing a lot of, of, a lot of problems with the pushing the block logic that I have. So a good example of that is if you push one on an edge and you fly up, I can fly right through the block. Um, I have yet to actually fix that problem, but again, this is really what's important about this test harness is that I'm able to go through and test out all these different kind of situations. So here is a block on top of a block, and when I move them, I want really both of those blocks to move, but you can see I have some problems with my code. And another thing, with this is that now that I actually see the errors and how I need to fix them, let's say for example like I wanted to launch this game and I couldn't fix these in time, which I clearly didn't, I'm able to design my levels around these issues. So I know I can set up situations in the test harness to test out, say okay what happens when, when three blocks are on top of each other or when one block is on a corner and you fly into it, and then I can go back to my level design and make sure that I'm not putting the blocks in situations where it's going to look really bad to the player. A, a prime example is that there's no notion of, of, of these killing other aliens. There's no death. You can't kill an alien. So I make sure that wherever a block goes, it doesn't fall on an alien or block an alien's path. So these are all kinds of things you want to think about when you're going through and designing your game. Spikes are also a really great way to slow down the player, especially in a game like this where they're flying a lot or they're falling into places where they can't see. So an important optimization trick that I wound up doing is each one, I would have a, I would have um, the base sprite graphic is three of these spikes together. And I would put these spikes all over the place and when I needed to be really long one, I would just put a lot of them together but each one of these entities has an overhead and it winds up being very expensive in the end. So what I wound up doing is I can now create a variable width um, spike. So the one up at the top is just one spike, but it's stretched out the whole way. So in the level editor, I can go through and tweak the width of the spikes. And this allows you to get these really long spikes or do really interesting things, whereas before you might have just been limited to having a tile for it or having just an, an, an entity. So and in the real game, they actually hurt the player when they fall on it. This is all set to the, uh, the kids mode so that I can test it all, but it's, it's generally an easy thing to switch back and forth and test between. So those are the main, um, oh, the, sorry, the other one that I want to talk about uh, is switches. So there are all kinds of different switches. Switches come with doors usually. So this is a switch that is not sticky. So as soon as you walk over it and you walk off of it, it releases itself. This one on the right would be a sticky switch. So you get on that and then all of a sudden it, it'll be locked forever. Then you can do more interesting things like timers. So I hit this switch and this door will stay open for X amount of time. I can control multiple doors at the same time and I can close them or put them in, you know, at odd times. Also, I have some logic in there that the doors won't close uh, on the player and kill the player. So if they're on a delay, they wait for the player to go by. So there's a lot of really powerful things you can do with doors and switches. Uh, one of the things that's really cool in Impact is that in the level editor, you can, you can apply uh, properties to each entity when you create it. So one of the things you can do is set up targets and a target basically says, it's just a reference to another object in the world. So this switch right here has a target one and a target two. Target one would be this door and target two would be this door. So that when the switch gets initialized, I can go through and parse it, the targets and set up the logic to be able to control each of those doors. 
So another really good thing about uh, Impact Level Editor. So now that you've seen everything, all the aliens and all the obstacles, here's a demo level showing how to put it all together. So this really, really slow alien kind of seemed useless before, but he actually fills a really important role. Uh, he's kind of like a moving block, basically. So I can use him to hold down switches and move. Also, I can have aliens that trigger switches, just like the player would. So in this case, you now have to wait for the alien to walk by. Also, if you wait and the alien walks by over the switch again, he'll actually kill the player because it'll force the door down. Uh, whereas before, if you just had it on a timer, it wouldn't automatically close. And here you'll see there's a block. I can push a block over, get the switch, and the door will open. So all of these together make for some very interesting puzzles and really come down to the actual game design. And the key of what I was trying to achieve with this game was making sure that I had enough pieces to make very intriguing puzzles, and at every turn of the game, I'm trying to push the player to get deeper into this maze and forcing them to use up their oxygen supply. So that's kind of why it takes so long to push one of these boulders is because is it really going to be worth it for you to spend the time pushing the boulder, losing your air to get to the other part of the, uh, the other part of the maze? Then real quick, we have these collectibles. So the real goal of the game is to actually collect stuff. So as you can see, each one of these is kind of random. And when you roll over one, I have different types. So I have unique, I have rare, I have five different types. And they all are worth a certain value. So as you pick them up, they're random each time, so you never know what they're going to be. Um, and this just allows the player to, to actually collect stuff and get a score. There's also these crystals. And you see I have, I have a lot of variations of different, um, of different artifacts to pick up. So I really try to add as much different variation to it and also keep the player guessing whether it's going to be a really good item or a really bad one. So another key thing and a really great trick um, that you might notice is the lighting effects and the scale lines, uh, the scan lines in the game. So in this demo, you can turn that stuff off and see what the game actually looks like. I'm sure you can't see the difference of the scan lines on the stream, stream, but you know, I wound up with these pixels. This is what the game looks like untouched. And Naki did a great job of doing the artwork, and I really wanted it to be tight and claustrophobic. So one of the ways I can make the game tight and claustrophobic is by making the artwork really big. And the problem is, is that in this case, it looks really flat, and this isn't a very appealing looking game. So I started out with all kinds of different techniques like ray tracing and lighting effects and, and trying to get some really great lighting in there, and it was just too much um, for Canvas to handle, especially on mobile devices. And it really didn't even look that good. So I went back to the drawing board, and I actually realized that if I just put a transparent PNG with a gradient on top of the player and move that with the player, the lighting effect becomes really awesome. And it actually cost almost nothing to render this PNG on top of it. So, you know, really when you're building HTML5 games, you want to think of the simplest solution possible in order to make sure that, you know, you're, you're, you're behaving on performance and that your game is always going to run great no matter what. And if it really came down to it, I mean, I could have turned lighting on and off, but I want to make sure that my game just runs right everywhere. Uh, the scan lines also help break up the, the really chunky pixels. Some other things that I'll show off real quick with the lighting off is I have these effects in here. Um, I don't know if they come up on the stream, but here you'll see these little particles. I have like these water particles that come down. So wherever I have rooms that have a lot of space, I will actually, um, I'll put a particle emitter. And because having all these particles gets very expensive as well, uh, what I do is I have a pool so the level will have, let's say, 50 particles that it can use, and it just randomly places them at these different targets throughout the level. So here would be a target. There might be another place yeah, right over here is, is a gap as well. So when a particle goes and hits the ground or it runs, it has like a life cycle, so when it fades out, it just gets respawned somewhere else. So in this way, you never really have this kind of clumping of, of uh, pixels or pixel-like uh, particle effects. 
And it really adds just a little bit of extra detail as you're going around that the, the level has life to it. Impact does support animated backgrounds, but they're very expensive to use. So in this case, I still want to have a little bit of motion going on to make you feel like the level is alive. Another really key piece of the game, which happened at the 11th hour, is this radar. Uh, somebody had posted on um, Google Plus a, radar, uh, a mini map plugin, and I was all excited. I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll give it a try. I really was against having a mini map in the game because I wanted this to be claustrophobic and not being able to find your way and get lost very easily. Um, but when I looked at his, his mini map, it actually was a radar. And I feel like the radar does a really great job of still getting the player to move in a certain direction to look for stuff while not giving away all the secrets of how to get around. So things like this exit sign here will always stay at the top of the radar while other things have to come into view. And what's really great about this is that I was able to use the same logic for the, um, for the uh, virtual control that keeps this big circle uh, in range of the little circle. I use the same logic here in this radar. So, you know, try to reuse your code as much as possible. The other thing that this radar does is it actually keeps track of every single object in the game and whether those things are in view or not. So impact doesn't really have the notion. It doesn't render things that are off screen, but it doesn't have a way of notifying entities that they're off screen or not. So a big thing would be like if your alien or your, your bad guys or something has sound effects, what you can do is I, I use this radar now to tell everything when it's in view, and when it's in view, it plays its sound effects. When it's outside of the radar, it doesn't play the sound effects. So here is something that became a visual aid in the game, actually becomes the main heartbeat of the game. So and there's some really, you know, uh, really nice um, effects. Like I said, if you, if you see something on the horizon, it's too far off, it'll actually stay, um, I'm trying to, illustrate this, uh, this alien right here. You see the red dot on the left of the radar. You'll see it stays within the edge of the, the radar until you get too far away from it. So that is the radar. The last thing, like I had mentioned, was that there are these, um, these meters in the game. So there's a meter for your fuel that runs your uh, jetpack. There is one for the oxygen and one for uh, your life. And one of the best parts about uh, having this in JavaScript is that you can actually use the console to test these things out. So in this case, as I teach everyone how to cheat in my game, you can do ig.game.player health equals three, and you'll see that the health will go down. Um, same thing with air. The air will go down. So one of the things, I had all these kind of sensors and indicators that would flash because I wanted to give you this feeling like you're in a spacesuit. In this case, I just went through and I actually moved this into um, the, the light bar, the bars themselves. So as, the, uh, as each bar goes down, it starts pinging and it makes an audio sound that something is going on. And then it also flashes to give the player some attention as to what could be going wrong. Uh, in the game also as you play, you can, um, you can also um, uh, recharge your energy and stuff. So, you know, th these are just the basic thing of how to do the meters. And they're really simple. They're just sprites on their own. And I have, um, I have a background that gets rendered when they start running out. So I can actually I take advantage of the fact that you can draw a particular width of an image to the display. So in this case, I have this full bar. And then as the light goes down, I just draw a percentage of that bar. And it can never get smaller than the, uh, the icon indicator on the left. Another thing that I do, which may not seem too important, but if, if the light bar is 100%, I don't draw the background behind it. So, I mean, a lot of the times you're gonna see the background, but it's just a little bit extra um, optimization because the way that these kind of things figure out is that the more you collect items, the less things that are being rendered or maintained in the game. So when you start out the game, you're gonna start out with two health bars that are a health bar and your energy bar that are filled up and that little bit of difference plus picking up other stuff might actually increase the frame rate. I've actually never had any problems with the frame rate. This should be running at 60 frames a second on computers and equally as good on, uh, on mobile devices. So 
That is the meters. And the last demo that I have here really is just a basic um, hello world. But so Impact uses uh, a very custom sprite sheet for fonts. You, uh, on the Impact website, if you go to the font section, you can submit a font on a form, and it will generate a sprite sheet that has one pixel lines below each character. And it uses that in order to see the width of how big each character is. I was having a lot of problems with that on Surface, and there was also some issues that were popping up on Retina Display uh, MacBooks. So what I did was I changed out the font class to actually use a texture atlas. And this is really great because I can create all kinds of different fonts now, and I can just change the size in the generated um, atlas, and I can, I can have this be a little bit more dynamic than the way that it was done before. And there's no overhead now in having to pre-process the font file. So right away, I'm able to get a little bit more performance. So these are all the demos, and this is my test harness for the game. The, uh, I'll switch back over to my slides. And hopefully everyone's now seeing the it's demo time. So I've kind of gone over everything. I'll be wrapping up now. The things that uh, I, I want to also highlight is that if you have any interest in kind of how I made the game, it doesn't go into a lot of depth, but I keep uh, developer diaries on my website, so I do a lot of tweeting, probably a little too much tweeting about what I'm coding at the time. And now I've been pushing this stuff into my blog. So if you're interested in seeing kind of the evolution of Jetroid, you can go to my blog and you can go through and see all the updates. And I'm still adding stuff to it. I have a bunch of other projects that I'm working on. So my dev diaries are a pretty good place to kind of see what what I'm up to at any given point. Also, uh, I'm like I said, I'm a big fan of open source and free. So I've open sourced all the artwork for uh, Super Jetroid. So there's a bunch of stuff that, that, that I did keep just solely for the game, um, mostly because I've been too lazy to rebuild the zip file. But if you're interested in artwork for your game, which is usually the biggest stumbling block of getting started in a game, um, here's a great opportunity to get some free artwork. And it would be awesome if you gave us credit for it. Uh, you don't have to. It's the um, it's a very uh, open license to use, but again, you know, I want to make sure that as people are making games, a big thing I tell people is don't focus on the art. Even if you have to use squares, use rectangles, use anything, uh, colored, you know, circles, just to get the game going. Because the biggest part about game design is making a fun game. The artwork is not totally superficial, but the artwork can always be added later. A fun game mechanic cannot. So enjoy this artwork. If you go to my website, also um, at the bottom, if you scroll down to the bottom on the left, you'll be able to see that I have a bunch of other games. So I have a zombie game uh, artwork, and I have an RPG or a roguelike. So if you are in the New York area, a uh, big thing that I'm doing now are I'm running these uh, meetup groups called New York Game Makers. And I actually run two workshops on the weekend. So on Saturdays in the morning I have a beginner class and on in the afternoon I have an advanced class. And this is kind of the um, in-person version of one game a month. And what I'm really trying to do at Microsoft, these are all uh, at the Microsoft office in New York, and what I'm really trying to do is create a place for people to come and learn about making games, especially if you don't have any programming background, and also just a place to come and code. Because you'd be very surprised, like, you know, you work on your own in your own game for a long time, and then you come up for air, and you build a game that's really great for yourself, but not for others. And it's really important to share that. So being in a collaborative environment really helps. And if anyone is interested in doing these in their own location, um, let me know. I'm happy to help uh, support you guys. And I think, you know, making these kind of in-person places where people can just come and build games and not be on a game jam is kind of really critical to this movement that we're seeing where indie game developers are actually doing very well in app stores. And I think that, you know, it's nice to see that we've gone from these big AAA games on consoles and it's all coming back now to indie developers who are working, I guess, not working in their garage, maybe their parents' basement or wherever you're working um, to make your games. So 
also you can join the meetup. I have um, I post slides and stuff, so if you want to, you know, at least see the presentations and stuff that I give, you can get access to it there. And I usually do a good summary on my uh, my blog as well. Also, I just wanted to um, do some credits for the game itself because it wasn't just me; it was a lot of people. It's hard work. Um, so Sean McCracken did uh, the music. He also helped with a lot of the sound effects. Uh, he does all of the music for my games, and he's also a really great game developer, and you should check out his stuff. He has some really fun games on uh, iOS and Android. Uh, Naki Diaz, who I said did all the pixel art, he's done a bunch of art for my games, and I think he really did a great job and, and nailed it. And then also there's a few people I wanted to thank, just Richard, uh, Jake, and, and Seb, uh, or Jack, and Seb, uh, they all helped uh, test the game and had some really great feedback, even if it was stuff that I didn't want to hear. And it's something that's really important is you want to get people who are going to give you real feedback. Um, I know I posted my game up online, and I got a lot of stuff like, it's HTML5, you could have done this in Flash or whatever, and that really didn't help. Try to find people who really have a passion for what you're doing as well. And a lot of the stuff that Richard told me was a big pain in the butt. I had to go back through and redo so much of the game when I was just ready to release it, but it made the game that much better. And finding people who also know what they're talking about is a big help. So with that, I want to thank everyone for listening to me would seem like I'm talking to myself for the past hour. Um, again, you know, uh, visit my website. I have a lot of stuff on HTML5 games, Windows 8 game development. Also, if you're interested in these slides, you can get the slides online as well. And feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or to email me if you have any interest in HTML5 gaming and impact.